So the theme is his ruminations and his 2023 speculations. So PB Dams is so honored to have Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and LA Times columnist Michael Hilzik make a tradition to speak with us. I keep up with Mr. Hilzik through his blog where we read his articles before they're published in the LA Times. <laughs> Well, many of you know he has written seven books, the latest being Iron Empires about the clash between America's railroad titans. It's been interesting to see recently where Mr. Hilzik is able to pull from his books for his columns. For example, on his column about the fight over the Colorado River, he referenced his 2010 book, Colossus, on the building of Hoover Dam, where he, where his, um, words about Hoover are still relevant today. Mr. Hilzik wrote, Hoover and his deputy, Arthur Powell, Powell Davis, connived in 1922 to exaggerate the Colorado River's flow in order to persuade all seven states that it carried enough water to serve their interests then and into the future. Same arguments we have to do. While we know about Michael Hilzik through his writings, Perhaps in his ruminations today, he can share with us how he became a journalist, or if he always wanted to be a journalist. So please welcome Michael Hilton. Well, I thank you, Anne, uh, for that introduction. And I'll just say, um, that's for how I became a journalist. It happened a long time ago, and I think it just happened. So, um, uh, and I think it was lucky for me that it did, because the alternative would have been law school, and we didn't want that. Or at least I didn't. Um, anyway, thank you for uh, the invitation. Um, I think this is the first time I've been here in person in at least three years, maybe, maybe more. Um, but it's a pleasure, as always, to be with you, and I thank you all for coming including uh, the new members and, well, I guess, uh, and whoever is with us via Zoom. So um, before getting too deep into my main theme this afternoon, and I have narrowed it a bit, or at least changed it a bit from the general issue of ruminations, um, uh, before getting too deep into that, uh, I would just ask that we all take a moment to honor the luckiest man on the face of the earth. And uh, I'm sorry, Lou Gehrig, you're going to have to step aside because I'm talking about Joe Biden, who has been blessed with the astounding luck to have opponents as stupid <laughs> as today's crop of Republicans who seem to have nothing on their minds other than engaging in performative anti-democratic horseplay in front of the TV cameras, uh, to the point where Biden will not have to spend a dime on campaign commercials if, uh, for his re-election campaign. All he needs to do is run CNN clips from the State of the Union uh, speech and anything else these, these idiots choose to do in public. And between now and when the campaign really starts, that's going to be a lot to, to deal with. Um, and he can start now with the official State of the Union Republican response by Sarah Huckabee Sanders, which I'm sure you've all heard about, when she said that the choice for Americans is between normal and crazy. <laughs> and I think that's the only time she's told the truth in her entire professional life. So I don't think she meant what she thought she meant. Um, you know, or as they say in The Princess Bride, I don't think that means what you, anyway, I can't remember the line, but it's not, the, the, the word doesn't mean what you think. Now, so I'm going to give you some thoughts um, really on the, the state of journalism today, um, but I can't cover everything you may be interested to hear about, so I'm going to leave, uh, I hope, plenty of time for questions, comments from you and from uh, your uh, fellow members on Zoom. Um, and so on to my main topic, which, as I said, is the state of America's press today, but more specifically, whether the press is up to the task of covering almost anything of importance, real importance, genuine importance, to the voting public. And I'm going to start with 
a single generalization based on what is now, uh, I'm sorry to say, my fifth decade in this business, which is that the quality of reporting in the American press is the worst that I have witnessed in my entire career. And before I'm done, I'll try to explain why that is, and we're going to talk a little bit about what the consequences of that are for all of us. So let's start with coverage of the presidential campaign ahead, particularly coverage of the current leading Republican candidate other than Donald Trump, and that's Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. Now, I've written a lot about DeSantis more than one would expect for a California columnist writing about Florida. Um, but uh, as I'm sure you all have sensed, this is a guy who's got all the charisma of a linoleum floor. <laughs> and as my friend Charlie Pierce of Esquire says, he's got the rhetorical skills of an andiron. <laughs> uh, Charlie's got a great way with words. Um, but elite political reporters, these are the people who live and write in the Washington, D.C. bubble, already are skipping over DeSantis' toxic policies in favor of examining as deeply as they can how these policies will sell on the campaign trail. And this follows a long-honored, or at least a long re repertorial tradition of how when you don't want to cover the issues or even get into the issues because they're too complicated, you just cover the controversy. That's the easy way out. So never mind examining how DeSantis is pursuing the 40-year effort begun by Ronald Reagan to obliterate public trust in education and government and fomenting, fomenting hostility toward the low-income immigrant and LGBTQ communities. That's the job of journalists is to look into this and explain it and examine it, and it is not being done. Now, one problem, one reason for this is the press's fetish for objectivity. And I'm going to, you know, the scare quotes are deliberate. Um, objectivity, as we, we've come to understand it, at least some people have come to understand it, is that as a reporter or editor, you present both sides or all sides of an issue neutrally, as if every assertion and every viewpoint has an equal call on credibility. And we know in our real lives that this is not true. Um, and in fact, objectivity as defined that way is a fairly recent uh, and brief development in American journalism. Uh, in the old days, and go back to uh, the Second World War or earlier, um, newspapers were known to inject viewpoints or explanatory viewpoints into their reporting because that was what that was the value that an experienced correspondent provided to readers. Anyway, this fetish for objectivity translates into what we call both sides ism. If you find or want to write about Republicans doing something bad or dishonest, you have to acknowledge, you have to list something or find something so that you can say that, well, Democrats do it too. And you could say, well, Republicans and Democrats are both guilty of something or other. And early in my career, uh, I learned the truism that when you're writing about a controversy, it's always acceptable to say that everybody's a victim or everybody's guilty or what have you. But as I said, we know that's not true. Um, never mind that in this case, one side is qualitatively very, very different from the other. So a fair story, a responsible story about DeSantis would delineate how his battles against Disney, trans kids, teachers, reading, and science itself affect Floridians on the ground. It would remind readers that his campaign against sensible anti-COVID practices has given his state one of the highest rates of COVID deaths in the nation. In March 2021, March 2021, that's a long time ago, Politico ran a story headlined, How Ron DeSantis Won the Pandemic, as if this was a football game or a track meet. 
March 2021, even at the time of that piece, it was clear that DeSantis wasn't winning, he was losing, or more precisely, his constituents were losing. Florida's COVID death rate at that time was about 155 per 100,000 population. California's was only 141. Now, uh, a lot of journalists said, well, gee, you know, Florida is 155, California is 141. It's all it's pretty much the same, isn't it? Even though Florida is opened up and California is locked down. And I wrote at the time, I said, it's not anywhere nearly the same. The difference isn't trivial. If California had Florida's death rate, there would be more than 6,000 more Californians dead from COVID. And if Florida had California's death rate, Roughly 3,000 fewer Floridians would be dead from the pandemic. Well, today, just to keep you up to date, the overall COVID death rate in California is 250 deaths per 100,000 population. In Florida, it's 400. So maybe DeSantis won the pandemic in terms of winning re-election in Florida, and I'm not going to say anything about Florida voters here. Um, uh, uh, rest ipsa loquitur if, you, if there are any lawyers in the place the thing speaks for itself uh, but if for Floridians he is the herald of death 32,500 Floridians would be alive today if Florida only had California's death rate and in the vaccine era alone that's from January 2021 to the present the death rate in California is 100 and in Florida, it's 234. That's 30,000 Floridians dead because DeSantis has concentrated, really focused on undermining faith in the vaccines and all other remedies or other approaches to COVID that we know work. More recently, Politico wrote that, and I'm quoting here, most nonpartisan observers have had to grant that DeSantis is not so much a Trump toady as he is a Trump trade-up. Similarly transactional, but significantly less bombastic, more ideologically coherent, and much more disciplined and strategic. This is all uh, a, uh, an artifact of the Washington journalistic impulse to cover everything as though it's a horse race. Um, but, well, I don't know. Is DeSantis less bombastic? Has Politico attended even a single DeSantis press conference? He's pretty damn bombastic. Ideologically coherent? Well, I suppose if your ideology is to do anything that positions you as the articulator of the creepiest variations on right-wing orthodoxy, he's coherent, um, disciplined and strategic, maybe, but how many lives is his discipline costing? Now here's Pamela Paul, possibly the worst new addition to the columnist lineup at the New York Times. And that's a place that employs Ross Douthat and David Brooks and Brett Stevens, who by the way is Pamela Paul's ex-husband. Recently she wrote, DeSantis's maverick approach to education has brought widespread condemnation from Democrats, particularly from their more progressive wing. A law like the Stop Woke Act of 2021, this is the law that basically forbids teachers at all levels uh, and even private corporations from uh, having programs or making statements that I guess DeSantis thinks are woke, whatever that means. Anyway, a law like the Stop Woke Act may come with some egregious efforts to curtail free speech, she writes, but it's important to recognize that aspects of it appeal to Floridians tired of racial and ethnic divisiveness and the overt politicization of what's taught in the classroom. As many liberals will quietly acknowledge, and I'm still quoting her here, the Parental Rights in Education Act, this is the which she says opponents nicknamed the don't say gay law, has reasonable and legitimate attractions for a broad range of parents who worry about the focus, efficacy, and age appropriateness of what their kids are learning in primary and secondary schools. So 
let's wade into this sewage. A few things. Widespread condemnation from Democrats. Well, the Stop Woke Act has been blocked by judges in every court where it's been tested thus far. Florida judges, not progressive Democratic judges, but Republicans. And who are these liberals who, quote, quietly acknowledge that the don't say gay law has reasonable and legitimate attractions for parents? Well, they must be real quiet because I've never heard of one, really. Uh, and what are its reasonable and legitimate attractions? Well, Paul doesn't list any. She doesn't even link to anything that suggests there are some. So I think we're, it's fair for us to assume there aren't any. As for DeSantis' attacks on fair play, accommodation, and intellectual inquiry in our schools, I would remind you what George Orwell said, which is, look to the language. Paul calls these attacks a maverick approach. The racism and bigotry of DeSantis' attack on school courses and curricula that deal honestly with America's past and present, quote, certain racial issues. So the straining after both sides do it balance has led to some truly absurd assertions in the press. And here's Peter Baker in the New York Times. And I don't mean to pick on the New York Times, uh, although, you know, they claim to be, uh, you know, the, uh, the agenda setter for other journalists, and they are. So I think they deserve uh, special scrutiny. But anyway, here's Peter Baker. After some classified documents were discovered at Biden's private residences and offices. Quote, one of the most significant costs to Biden of the documents case is the opportunity cost. Democrats will now have a hard time using Trump's mishandling of classified papers against him, even though the particulars of the two cases are markedly different. Well, markedly different is right, because we know Trump lied and deliberately blocked government access to his stolen documents. Biden invite, invited the FBI in. If Americans don't grasp those differences, that's the fault of people like Baker and his colleagues. And it turns out, according to opinion polls, that Americans actually grasp the differences quite well, even despite this, uh, uh, this effort to make it seem like Biden is right, but it's a problem for him that he's right. Then there's the depicting of everything that happens in America as having troublesome consequences for Joe Biden. So here's the Washington Post on the balloons. Quote, what are they? Who sent them? What do they want? Are there more coming? These aren't from the ominous beginnings of your favorite alien invasion movies. These are some of the questions President Biden is likely to get from Congress after the latest UFO shoot down. Well, you know, this is a sample of some of the turns of phrase that Washington reporters use to posit political consequences on no evidence whatsoever. Lines are blurred, clouds are gathering, questions are raised. In the middle of the night, I should tell you, when I'm tossing and turning over how to report and write a column on some complicated issue, uh, or some uh, difficult topic, I, I sometimes wish I had a job like these reporters, where all I'd have to do is raise questions and find blurred lines. So let's see how this works. Uh, one, one more example, relative to another current issue, the debt ceiling. Last week, the New York Times once again promoted an article by tweeting, Raising the U.S. debt ceiling has increasingly been used as a political tool, leading to intense showdowns in 2011, 2013, and now 2023. But who's behind the debt itself? Now, what the Times was trying to get at, what it was implying is that both, both sides do it. Both sides use the debt ceiling as a political tool, and both both sides are equally responsible for creating the debt. Well, neither of these assertions is true. Democrats have never used the debt ceiling as a political tool 
they've always passed it. And as for the debt, Donald Trump was responsible for 25% of all the federal debt incurred in this nation over its entire 230 year history. Now, as I said, I don't want to necessarily pick on New York Times or Politico or the Washington Post. So let's look at a recent article in a newspaper that where I still get a paycheck. <laughs> this was a piece about New College of Florida, which you may know the story is a liberal arts school that started out as a private institution, but then ran into financial trouble and did what it thought was sort of a sensible uh, step it affiliated itself as part of Florida State Public University system. Now that's given DeSantis an opportunity to trash it, which he has done by firing its board uh, and replacing it with right-wing lickspittles like Christopher Rufo, who fired New College's president and replaced her with a, cr a crony of their own while raising his salary as president by $400,000 over his predecessors. Now, the story that we ran about this brouhaha began, in a hyper-politicized age, this small college overlooking Sarasota Bay looks set to become a pivotal battleground in the war over the mission of public universities. Now, I had some problems with this language, and um, I brought them very quietly to my editor, and, it, and my concern sort of died at that level. But I would, start, I would point out to you that the war over the mission of public universities has been going on for years, almost always provoked by conservatives. It was Ronald Reagan running for governor of California in his first campaign who made an issue out of the free speech movement on the Berkeley cam campus. He called it the filthy speech movement. It was Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin who moved to destroy the principle of tenure protection in his state's universities. DeSantis is a Johnny come lately in this war. He's just, I guess, more disciplined and strategic about it. Uh, and, and the battle over New College of Florida is not really about the mission of public universities. It's about the use of public universities for graft, and that's what's going on there. I would also ask, is our age really hyper-politicized? Now, this is a, an extremely threadbare and tired idea, this claim that we as a nation are deeply polarized. And I wrote a column about this some point in the last year, I think, or maybe a year and a half, it's a facile description that ignores how Americans really think about the most important issues. To me, polarization means a 50-50 split with everybody at one pole or the other pole, and no one left in a position to mediate these two sides. That's not the United States. In America, there's actually great agreement on big issues. More than 70% of Americans, at least 70% of Americans, want stricter gun control. About 80% want abortion to be legal. Has anything changed? Are we more politicized than we used to be? When I talk about this concept, I often ask people to identify for me what they think was the single most polarized presidential election in modern times, that is, the one with the largest percentage margin between winner or loser in the popular vote, uh, let's say in the last 120 years. Now, this is the audience participation moment in my talk. And does anybody want to take a guess? No. It was Goldwater. That's correct. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson beat Barry Goldwater with 61.05% of the vote. That was the margin. The margin was about a little less than 40, uh, uh, 20%. Second place in this race goes to FDR versus Alf Landon, 1936, when FDR got 60.8% of the vote. So Johnson got 
FDR got 60.8. Uh, Richard Nixon, victory over McGovern in 1972, 60.7%. What that tells you is that the United States, these, and these were all, by the way, races that were deemed landslides. And that was based on the electoral college vote and the number of states that went uh, to, uh, to either candidate in the electoral college. Basically, America is and has been for more than a century a 60-40 country. Today, as always, the candidates will be fighting over that middle 20%. So we're not polarized. We have a large majority favoring sensible policies and a small minority with an enormous megaphone called Fox News. And, uh, and I won't get into the latest news about Fox News, which if, if you've seen, uh, if you have an opportunity, by the way, to read Dominion's uh, filing with all of the emails and statements made by the Fox News talent and executives about uh, the, these claims of electoral fraud, you should do it. It's extremely entertaining and, uh, and appalling and, and frightening. Um, nevertheless, we're constantly plied with unsupported claims about polarized America as though we don't have a, a common ground to meet, to decide these questions. And that simply overlooks the fact that these questions have been decided. This country wants tighter gun control. This country wants abortions to be legal and much more liberally uh, offered than they are today in more than half the states now. Uh, and here again, here's, you know, I'm sorry, the New York Times once again reporting on COVID policy. The politicization of the virus was perhaps inevitable in a country as polarized as America has become, but it, cer it almost certainly inhibited our ability to have an intelligent discussion about it. So once again, I don't know about this. The virus was deliberately politicized by one side, not both sides, by Trump and the Republicans who thought they could make political gains out of it. They have been abetted not only by Fox, but the mainstream press, which treats established science about the virus, about treatments for the virus, about the origins of the virus, as something up for grabs for political debate. These are not political questions. They are scientific and empirical. And by saying that, well, Republicans say this, or Democrats say this, and Republicans say no, that's really not doing justice to the issue. Anyway, I haven't had much trouble having intelligent discussions about the virus because I just, I don't have discussions with imbeciles. <laughs> <laughs> and it's generally pretty easy to identify. All right, so in closing, let me talk a little bit about why the press's performance is so wretched. One reason, obviously, is resources, and it's something that we all in newspapers, TV uh, companies, cable companies, are grappling with what do we do about our shrinking resources, our shrinking revenues. Newspapers and TV news operations simply don't have the money they had when I entered this business. Part of the reason for their decline, though, is that, that their managements have made choices. They've made the choice not to invest, but to drain their companies for dividends and profits. They swallowed the idea that you can give your customers less and charge them more and be okay. Fewer correspondence, a smaller news hole, fewer movie reviews, fewer comic strips, you name it. You all know what the great smorgasbord newspapers used to be, including the Los Angeles Times, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and, and it's just not as much. When I was at the Providence Journal, which was the newspaper that, uh, that I worked at before coming to the LA Times, this was in the uh, 1970s, late 1970s. The, the Providence Journal was known as the premier local newspaper in the entire US. We had 15 local news bureaus around the state. We used to say, there was a Providence Journal News Bureau basically every three miles in Rhode Island. Uh, 
um, 15 local news bureaus around the state and in southern Massachusetts. We used to joke that there were days when nothing that happened in the state of Rhode Island didn't get into the Providence Journal. <laughs> the largest bureau at that time had 30 reporters and editors just to cover one big suburban community. Uh, today, the Providence Journal has 30 reporters and editors to cover the entire state. The journal is part of Gannett now. So on the plus side, uh, apparently it's allowed to rerun as many articles from USA Today as it chooses to, if it thinks that's what its readers want. But another problem with the press is that reporters have gotten lazy. I had a, a professor when I was at journalism school who cautioned us that every reporter just wants a nice, warm, moist place. Um, and, and his point was, you know, if you're my student, you, you are going to have to learn to avoid that uh, tendency. Uh, but reporters have gotten lazy because to study an issue or a program before writing about it takes time uh, for management. It takes time and money. It's overhead. So it's easier to say, well, the Democrats say this and the Republicans say that, and who's winning this week? Uh, do we believe the Republicans more or um, the Democrats? And leave it at that. But that means that readers and voters are left in the dark. And let me just say that there is no excuse for intellectual slothfulness on the scale we see today when the information that de democracy needs is hanging in the balance. Take Social Security. When I write about it, I draw from decades of studying it. I've read every word of the 1935 congressional hearings on creating Social Security, and I've read every word of the debates over every, every expansion. Yet, I sometimes say that I feel trapped in the torture of Sisyphus. And if you know your mythology, Sisyphus was a mythical king who betrayed Zeus and was condemned to roll a boulder up a mountain, and whenever he got to the top, it rolled back down again. So no matter how many times I write that the program is not going bankrupt, that it doesn't have an effect on the federal deficit, that it was not designed so that no one could collect because no one lived to 65 in the 1930s, that the trust fund isn't worthless IOUs, but U.S. Treasury securities paid for with your payroll taxes that yield interest every month and every year. The Washington Post or the New York Times will write a story saying, oh my, Social Security will blow up the federal deficit and the trust fund doesn't exist, or that Democrats and Republicans have, quote, sharply divergent approaches to the program. Sharply di divergent, yeah. It's not untrue that Democrats want to expand Social Security and the Republicans want to kill it. I suppose that's the virgin approach. <laughs> so excuse me while I roll the boulder back up. <laughs> anyway, I will leave it right there with the final thought that it's up to people like yourselves to keep democracy alive through information, through fighting the foxification of news by fighting it with real information, real understanding. And I don't know if that will work in the long run, but it's an honorable effort and a crucial one. So thank you. So we're going to take questions from on uh, chat and also uh, from the audience. But I want to go with the one from chat just because I want to say something about it as well. So one thing that I will say that's been honorable about the LA Times is that I get a, some of the newsletters from Sammy Ross, his climate, and uh, some of the others, um, book review. And anyway, what's nice is that they refer to your columns, too. And, uh, and you also refer to them. And so one of the questions has to do with uh, about climate change. And this is from... Um, So from Walter, and he would like to. 
Uh, well, Walter's question is, please comment on press coverage of climate change and the essential reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I want to say, first off, that I really try to avoid, as much as I can, using the term climate change. Climate change was a term that was cooked up by Frank Luntz, who's a Republican uh, consultant. He's the one who gave us death panels, you know, in the fight against Obamacare and a number of other tropes. Uh, climate change really doesn't tell you what's going on. The term that I use is global warming because that's what is happening. Uh, anyway, um, the fact that, that everybody else talks about climate change should tell you that press coverage of climate change has been uh, poor, incredulous, um, shallow, but it's beginning to change, I think, lately, because the evidence of the effects of global warming are becoming more and more inescapable with every day that passes. Uh, we see it in California, we see it on the coastline, we see it uh, with every storm, we see it with, uh, if not totally unprecedented, then certainly unusual uh, weather patterns uh, across the country and across the world. So I think people are waking up, and uh, 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 you mentioned Sammy Roth, who's uh, who's a great reporter on these issues. We have uh, several others, including Ian James, who's uh, working hard on uh, Warner issues. Um, so we're spending a lot more, uh, we're giving this a lot more attention. And I think the other newspapers are beginning to do that too. That's in the back. Ask about the, uh, what I think is the elephant in the journalistic room, which is in, in 2016 coverage of Hillary's emails. And endless, right? And I, I waited to, to see if even one article about Trump's fake charities. Never saw it in the LA Times. Trump, I'm sorry, Trump's. Trump's fake charities. Remember, that was an issue that grew up around the same time, but I never saw anything about it. Do you think things have gotten any better or there any lessons learned from 2016? Uh, well, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, the question is um, refers to the press's coverage in, tw in the 2016. Uh, uh, presidential election uh, that focused so heavily on H Hillary's emails. Um, uh, and this was the assertion that Hillary was using a non standard um, app uh, or, or program and that she had her own server. And it was all a lot of obviously nonsense because, as she said from the beginning, um, every email she sent that uh, on official business uh, was recorded. Uh, on government servers, so, uh, but yes, the coverage of that was relentless, and it was uh, unfortunately timed because it blew up, at some point it blew up right before the actual vote, Thanks. thank you, James Comey. Um, you, uh, you asked whether I think things have improved. Uh, I think the evidence before us thus far is that things have not improved. Uh, the press is still focused on the latest shiny object. It is still uh, willing to, you know, uh, the Hillary Clinton emails thing was an artifact of both sides -ism. Um I think reporters at the time were so convinced that she was going to walk into office that they were desperate to find something bad to say about her. And they went with it and it hurt. Uh, but I don't think we have learned a thing. Uh, in the intervening six or eight years. So. What's the major problem facing the major news outlets is decreasing revenue, apart from the Times and New York and the Washington Post and perhaps the LA Times. Do you see any hope that that will be reversed in the short term or near term future? Well, I'm not sure it will be reversed, but as I think I mentioned, everybody is trying to find a formula that will. Uh, be some sort of answer to it. I mean, we have moved from relying uh, as heavily as we used to on advertising revenue to trying to rely more on subscriptions. Uh, we offer special access to certain stories, but to subscribers, we try to uh, limit, uh, everybody does, access uh, to free articles on our websites 
through paywalls, you can read a certain number of articles uh, per month, and then you have to start paying. All these things, uh, I don't think anybody is quite sure that these are going to be an answer, because one of the mistakes we all made was starting this transition to, uh, to online rather than print publication was by making it free. So everybody got used to it being free and now resents it when they're asked to pay. So it's going to be a long transition and I don't think anybody can be quite sure how it's going to work out. It's there in the back. Yes. Uh, if you have any pushback or any reaction from anything that we've criticized, you have to do so relentlessly and actually. Do they, do they say, well, yeah, you have a point, or do they sit back and get to your uh, I hear mostly from people who agree with me. <laughs> uh, people, I, I mean, I, I, I have had pushback from journalists and others who disagree with me, and, you know, when that happens, I try to make a judgment as to whether their criticisms are sound and fair, and sometimes they are, um, uh, and sometimes they're, they're not, and, you know, this is, making that judgment is part of deciding whether I want to engage in a dialogue, and sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. I, I, I can tell you, this is a little bit off uh, the, the, the question, but the most response that I ever received in my entire career to uh, anything I wrote uh, was to a column I wrote, I think a year ago, uh, January 2022, in which I raised the question of how should we think about people who go public and campaign against the COVID vaccines or against COVID uh, treatments or what have you, um, and then die of COVID unvaccinated. And um, the, he the headline on the piece, um, which was important because a lot of the critics read the headline and then stopped reading and hit the send button um, was um, should these people, I can't remember exactly that was, uh, mocking these people is uh, difficult but may be necessary, something to that effect. Anyway, I got just a torrent of response. Um, by email, it was mostly uh, at least 90% negative. Um, but it was also um, some of the least edifying responses that I've received on anything because, you know, a lot of the emailers basically were drawing from a vocabulary of maybe eight words, none of which I could repeat, uh, none of which I could print, certainly. A repeat. Um, but anyway, as, as time went on, um, I went on Michael Smirkonish's show. He invited me to talk about it. And I, I, I did some podcasts. And um, Smirkonish had done a, a poll on his website about this article, this column. And it turned out that the response, and Smirkonish is, you know, left of center, but fairly centrist. The response was 60 40 in my favor. So a lot of it depended on what um, uh, what venue people were using to comment. Um, and I still get on Twitter, you know, every so often somebody will say, you know, this is a guy who wrote this. Um, but again, the point I was making was that um, we have a tendency in our culture to basically feel that you shouldn't speak ill of the dead, that every death uh, basically costs us as human beings. And I said, maybe we need to reconsider that when we have somebody who has basically made a point of trying to persuade people to, to take steps that are injurious to their health, their community's health, their family's health, their friend's health, uh, and uh, basically parading around as though they're in the right and then showing by the, the ultimate um, Sacrifice that they were wrong. So, yes, sir. Uh, 
But see, I mean this kind of respectfully, that you're inside the industry, and so you have a better scope on the question that I want to ask, but I want to kind of frame it so that you can respond. Um, let's say, on one hand, you've got Murdoch, who owns Fox News. I think he owns uh, Wall Street Journal, a number of tabloids, uh, Washington Post, and so- No, the New York, York Post. New York Post, okay. And then there's some influences that happen where you said you were writing a story and then you went to the editor and then it didn't get printed. There's this, maybe a, a screening that happens from above in the industry that kind of helps the news either get to us or not get to us. And then on the other side of it, you have um, a whole lot of people that can repeat things enough that it almost becomes true, like in Facebook or Instagram or some of these other things. And there's this kind of competing thing that kind of happens in there. How do we, how, how do we screen for that stuff? How do we, you know, kind of navigate that? How do you navigate in that? Do you find that that's kind of the competition? Well, I think, uh, you know, when you're talking about social media, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, these are by their nature unscreened platforms. Uh, and I think it's, we should all be responsible enough and intelligent enough to recognize that they're unscreened and that uh, I've told people over and over again, I love Twitter or I have loved Twitter, uh, mostly because it was a platform that, that I could curate. I could choose to follow uh, accounts and these would be accounts either people that I knew who were responsible or who had shown uh, that they had something to, to, to say, something to tell me. If they could point me to papers and links and discussions that would add to my knowledge. Um, it's a little bit harder today than it was um, before last April 15, but it still works that way. Um, the only other way, um, and, and, you know, when I said, you know, I brought concerns to the editors, I didn't see the light of day. It was sort of an internal objection. You know, I said, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, this reporter, I, I, I think the way I put it is if I were the editor, that story would have been rewritten, you know. Um, and I, but I'm not, and nobody asked my permission uh, to run anything. But all I can do, um, given the, uh, the platform that I have, is to uh, uh, communicate what I see as the truth and to provide my readers with the evidence. I bring the receipts. If you read my columns online, you will see links that you can click on to every source that I use. I don't use anonymous sources. Uh, you know, I use public information, public papers, published things. Uh, if if I'm using something that hasn't been published officially, I ask the author, can I, can I use this? Um, and I march the facts across the page as, as, as well as I can. And I remain available to discuss this with anybody who's got a responsible uh, uh, objection or other point of view. And um, in some of the, some cases, I've ended up in long-term, years-long dialogues with somebody that started with them saying, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and But in a way that told me that um, maybe I should ask him or her why he or she thinks that. Uh, I, but then there are any number who say, you know, you're just a moron. And that, you know, that's, you know, if, if I'm lucky enough that they put that in the first line, then I, I can delete it uh, before reading. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to take one from the Zoom audience, okay? Okay, well, here's a question from Kay. Um, isn't, yes, Kay uh, Drew is a former colleague of mine. Um, Question, isn't part of the problem with today's journalism the difficulty of defining who is a journalist? Republicans believe Fox News is journalism, and how about social media, where supposedly most people get their news? Is that journalism? That's what the New York Times and LA Times are competing with. 
readership wise. Um, I guess um, the first thing I should say is I, I don't know who who should be in a position to decide who is a journalist. Um, there are various organizations and various committees um, that decide who's qualified to be in their group. The White House Correspondents Association, for example, can vet. You know, are you you know are you uh, representing a legitimate or even a semi-legitimate news organization? Um, but if you're just you know a guy who wants to um, chat, then you don't get in into the club. But it's very dangerous to give anybody the power to say you're not a journalist because as journalists we have a certain amount of access and even a certain uh, number of rights to do uh, our work and we don't want to have somebody to, to decide on whatever basis uh, you don't qualify for that protection you know, protecting sources rights that sort of thing um, so I think uh, uh, I, I think the entire industry has leaned over backwards to give Fox News the uh, the courtesy of treating them as a journalistic enterprise. I'm not sure how that approach will survive these latest emails. Uh, certainly, there's now uh, evidence uh, to deal with it, but. Um, social media, you know, at some level, if you've never picked up a telephone to call a source, then you're not a journalist, but uh, there are many ways to do journalism. Uh, in the old days, um, the term uh, correspondent basically derived from the fact that newspapers were getting correspondence from people who were on the scene uh, somewhere. And they would write letters, you know, letter from uh, wherever. And um, readers figured out how to read their newspapers, and they always do, uh, and make judgments as to whether somebody's credible. But that was, a, you know, in those days, I'm talking about going back to the 19th century, uh, a fairly effective way of getting information out to the public. So. Uh, we professionalized the the industry, um, you know, really starting in the, probably in the 30s and 40s, uh, and we've been grappling with the implications of that sort of categorization ever since. Yes, ma'am. Would you care to comment on the resetting of the doomsday clock and the potential use of nuclear weapons over in Ukraine? I don't think I really know enough about that to. To say, I mean, I followed the Doomsday Clock uh, uh, for for years. Uh, and I don't, I don't think in my lifetime it's ever been more than five minutes from midnight. So uh, it's all pretty incremental. And I think we all know. We've certainly heard a lot about the dangers of uh, Putin deciding to go take the last mile. Yes, sir. In the back. How did we move from newspaper and for that matter TV reporting of crisis daily, every day, meeting some kind of crisis situation and it's almost numbing to, was it that way? It wasn't that way 40, 50 years ago. How did we get to that? And then the use of one other little point in the LA Times too, the use of what we call tentative language. Some people think this, therefore it's sort of like a movement or um, what is some of you? you see, you, you've learned how to read the newspaper. Yeah. Um, well, these are all, uh, teacher, these, these are all uh, structures, uh, tropes, wh what have you, that enable us to suggest more than we really know. Um, when you see some people, many people, uh, it said that uh, then, uh, you know, I think you know that whoever has written that doesn't actually have the receipts, you know. But um, uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, our focus on crises, um, I think that's just always going to be with us. I mean, the immediacy 
of news is what draws readers. Um, you know, I can tell you when we look at uh, traffic on our website and uh, subscriptions, they track fairly closely to big, immediate breaking stories. Um, and we hope that uh, people who come to us because they want to know the latest about the balloons or the war in U Ukraine um, will we'll stay and take part uh, of everything else we have to offer. Uh, but it's, I think it's sort of a natural um, human tendency. Um, you know, when you know when you hear that you know an earthquake in Turkey and Syria has killed fifty thousand people, that that gets your attention. So a little bit related to that, it feels like in the last six, eight years, maybe it's been a decade, there's, I've been seeing, hearing, especially in broadcast, what I'd call a negative news, but it, it just negative news uh, tone, bias, yeah. For example, it was, it is always referred to as the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. Well, there was a withdrawal and there was whatever happened, but it's always referred to as a chaotic. You mentioned hyper uh, division in the country. What what is that? Can you speak to what, what what's powering that? What's fuel? Uh, I don't want to defend it. I think I, I should just say that um, everybody tries to inject as much drama as possible into what's happening for the same reason that we just talked about that um, that's what draws attention um, and um, I, I don't know you know any particular way around that um, it's a question here online uh, and I'm sorry I, I, I haven't been repeating the questions from the floor but anyway here's a question online as an LAT online subscriber I notice that the default presentation of articles to click on, yours are rarely offered. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm, I, you know, I thank you for uh, for the observation. Um, I actually think that that mine uh, do mine get a fair fair enough. I mean, we would all like to be featured more. Um, I think mine, uh, mine, all I can tell you is from the traffic statistics that we get in real time, actually, um, uh, you know, a suitable percentage of my articles are at the top of the hit parade on the day that they're published. So somebody is gaining access. Uh, yes, sir. Well, uh, your information when the doomsday clock started it was at about seven minutes till midnight, and then the best it got was at the end of the Cold War to about 16 minutes from midnight. Yeah. Well, the fact that it's now, wherever it is, two minutes, three minutes. A minute and one, one minute uh, tells you that maybe the 16 minute count was uh, uh, optimistic. Hmm. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, in the history of journalism, I know you're going back to uh, Mark Twain. Are there any journalists that are your favorites? Anybody you respect or admire or, or stands out to? Well, I would say that the journalist who I most admire above everybody else is Orwell. George Orwell. Uh, the question is in the history of journalism, is there anybody I particularly admire? Uh, George Orwell. I have uh, a book that's the collection of his columns. Um, and it's, I think, about 1,200 pages, maybe 1,400 pages. It's always on my desk. And, it, you know, it's a rare week that passes that I don't just come into it. And some of his essays are obviously classics. I mean, what, what Orwell, what makes Orwell great is that he was the most judicious, honest, um, fair minded writer in. In journalistic history, I mean, you you know, he was never shy about saying what he thought, 
He was never shy about exposing his own prejudices to uh, his reading public and saying that this is where I'm coming from. These are my prejudices. And I would, uh, uh, you know, his essay that I quoted from on English as a political language is a classic. If you have a chance, I would also advise you to read his essay on Gandhi. And what's interesting about his essay on Gandhi is that while we all like to think of Gandhi as, you know, as we think of him as, you know, a, a religious spiritual hero, um, because of the times he lived in, Orwell had to deal with him as a politician. And his essay on Gandhi is really is shot through with his observations on Gandhi's effectiveness as a politician and his influence on uh, British government because of that. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, what, would you, what would your advice be to like, combat some of the um, just really like negative rhetoric and uh, disinformation <clears throat> that's coming from? Uh, yeah, the question is, what would I do to combat the negative rhetoric coming from outlets like Fox News? Um, I, 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 as, as I said, I, there's no way that, uh, you know, there have been any number of studies by sociologists, political scientists, about how do you combat these sort of embedded um, misconceptions, mis you know, that are fomented by misinformation and disinformation, it is really not easy. What they tend to find, I think they find almost invariably, is that when you try to um, deal with somebody who's basically bought into some conspiracy, and you try to deal with it by presenting him or her with facts, that doesn't work. That just basically cements them deeper into their conspiracy. Um, I don't know if it's human psychology or what, but all I can do is uh, tell the truth and explain why I construe something to be the truth. Um, I, I don't really concern myself necessarily with combating Fox News because I think it's got its audience. It's a uh, hermetically sealed audience um, and uh, what gives Fox News the illusion of being powerful is that at least until recently but I think still it's the only game in town if you are a right winger you go to Fox so it's got every right winger um, if you are a progressive your your message is sort of spread among a wide range of outlets, not only the main, the, the big newspapers, um, but just a whole galaxy of uh, websites and web organizations. And I think it, it gets diluted, or at least we don't get the impression, there's not, there, there's not one huge megaphone for progressive thought. There are a lot of smaller megaphones. There are a lot of them, but the fact that Fox has this one huge megaphone sort of misleads people into thinking that uh, the uh, viewpoints that it articulates are, are either uh, more believed or more powerful than they really are. And we need to get away from that. Right. Who was your follow-up on Doug's question, uh, where you saw about the best journalists? There's a number of journalists that are now migrating to their own newsletters, their online newsletters. They want that are free, but they also would like you to pay for. And I was wondering what you thought of some of them and what you thought of that transition. Um, like Ron Hubbard or Timothy Snyder. Yeah, the, the question is what I think about the, uh, the journalists who move to newsletters, um, uh, outlets like Substack. Yeah, Substack. Um, some of them I like. Some of them I love, some of them I just uh, disdain. Um, and uh, some of them I pay no attention to. It's not something I would expect. But that transition, what do you think? Well, I think, you know, the transition has been happening because um, for a couple of reasons. One is that, that some of them get um, 
frustrated with having to um, basically be edited uh, and have bosses. Um, so, uh, you know, they see the opportunity to make money, maybe more money, um, by being off on their own. And Substack has sort of given them a platform that people can go to and find them. And the problem with being freelance basically has always been, you know, how do people find where you are? Substack has at least removed that problem from uh, the equation. But um, uh, there are some uh, Substack um, sites that I follow, you know, fairly assiduously, maybe not every day, but I go back every so often and go through their archives. And there, just as there are some um, websites that I do that. And, and then there are some that, you know, I already know who this person is, and, and he or she is not worth uh, spending my time on. I, I got a message here. Lynn McLeod wants to ask a question. Is Lynn? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, I, I have a bias to trust, which it may be called gullibility, but I know that in the times there are fairly frequently articles that say what you need to know about and it explains in a factual way um, a number of things about um, complicated issues and one I read was the about the debt ceiling and where it came from and why why it was put into place and um, why it doesn't need to be controversial and I find those very helpful. And I think what I'm saying is, is it all as bad as you say? Is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, is, is it are articles bad? like that as bad or is the debt ceiling as bad as I No, think? neither. Um, the journalism I read in the LA Times and oh, okay. you know I watch the news hour at night, otherwise I'm not a news glutton, but, um, as I say, I have a bias, bias toward trust, but I don't like to be taken in. Right. Well, uh, is it as bad as I say? Um, I, I guess, um, you know, you have to make your own judgment. Um, what I, look, I came into this business at a point where I was able to, to sort of ride the golden age um, journalism. We had a lot of money. We had a lot of, I had a lot of opportunity to uh, go abroad, uh, to go around the country. Um, and I never felt until really, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, that there were financial constraints. We had um, a, a vast foreign staff. Uh, we had a vast national staff. We had 50 business reporters. And we have much less of all of that now, and that's true everywhere. And what's taken up the slack is opinion writing. Um, now, I'm a columnist, but I don't consider myself an opinion columnist because I don't write and just say, here's what I think about this out of the, you know, top of my head. I try to, I you know, I do the reporting, I do the studying, uh, and then I, uh, give my readers what I've learned, as well as what I construe to be the significance. But there are a lot of columnists out there, there are a lot of writers who don't do that. They just think, and it's, I think it's a sort of arrogance that they think that what they think is of interest without telling us why they think that way. And uh, we, we, you know, Turn on CNN, turn on Fox, turn on MSNBC, and hours and hours are taken up now with uh, opinion programs where they'll, you know, they'll put seven people behind a desk and they'll shout at each other. Um, and the reason they do that, and the reason they do that instead of having reporters, and when I was in, when I was our Africa correspondent, CNN had two reporters in Africa, including one with me in Nairobi, one in West Africa, or maybe three, because they also had 
the staff in Johannesburg, they don't have that anymore. And the reason is that reporting like that costs overhead and they don't want to spend the money and opinion is free. And there are ways you can describe it that are not polite um, in terms of, you know, what every person has. Um, but it's, it doesn't cost anything. I mean, if they, you know, maybe they, they put some of these uh, opinion uh, speakers on the payroll. Uh, we certainly have a few on our payroll um, who, you know, if I were king or editor in chief, they would no longer be on the payroll. That's not neither here nor there. But basically, opinion has taken over uh, the news pages and the airwaves uh, and the cable waves because it's much cheaper and you can't get in as much trouble if you can just say it's opinion. You may know that Fox, is, uh, in its defense to one or another lawsuit, said, uh, Nobody believes he's telling the truth anyway. So, yeah. so. so it sounds like the answer is yes. <laughs> I can't remember what the question is. <laughs> if, you, if you're saying, if, if you're asking, you know, if if it really is as bad as I say, I, uh, I would say yes, it's as bad as I say. So speaking of that, the 2023 speculations, uh, do you think the minions going to prevail? Uh, I mean, you already talked about where you don't think Biden has a problem. You have any well, what I said was I don't. What I said was I don't think the balloon is Biden's problem. Uh, but in terms of whether Dominion <coughs> will win or lose, I, I don't know. All I know is if they win to the extent they want, that you know their claim is one point six yeah. billion. Smartmatic, which has the other um, electoral uh, lawsuit, slander lawsuit against Fox, is asking two point something billion. Uh, if you put them together, that, you know, Fox doesn't have much less left in the bank, but some. I don't know. Um, you know, jury selection in the Dominion case starts in April. Who knows if it's actually even going to get that? I mean, they might extract something from Fox that makes it no longer necessary to pursue the lawsuit. The money and you know, public mea culpa. Yeah. So, um, speaking about disinformation a moment ago, the scientists who maintain the doomsday clock now consider disinformation as along with nuclear war and. Uh, and global, global warming, thank you for using that term, as uh, existential threats to society. And I must say, after hearing you today, I'm going to go home and read, try to find out as much stuff about you as I can, as much of your writings as I can, after hearing the work and effort that you put into your columns to make sure that you are letting us know, as far as you're concerned, uh, so I think you're one of the best disinformation uh, forces in the land today. Fighter. Fighter. I, I hope you meant fighter to get this. Fighter. Disinformation critic. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, we all know that the right wing is light years ahead of us in terms of its messaging. What would be your prescription for fixing the pathetic democratic <laughs> You know, I, I've said before, maybe uh, before this very group, that Democrats, in, in my experience, you know, my long experience watching them, um, and I believe in my entire life, I, I know I voted for one Republican. But I can't be sure I ever voted for the second one. But in any event, Democrats, I think, are very good at providing the public what the public needs. I mean, not everything and not all the time. And really terrible about letting the public know that. And um, if you go back in history, you don't have to go that far. Um, the 
Democratic politician who was absolutely the best in history at making sure that the voters knew what was at stake was Franklin Roosevelt. He never let the sun, when he gave a speech, he made sure, you can read every speech, that his listeners and the public at large understood the difference between his approach and the Republican approach. We haven't had anybody like that. And of course, it's not fair to say that nobody's like FDR because, you know, it comes once in a millennium maybe. But um, uh, Obama was decent at it and better now than he even was as president. Um, and I think Biden is beginning, I mean, Biden, as I said at the outset, you know, has the astounding luck to have uh, opponents in the Republican Party who are going to give every opportunity to make clear the difference between normal and crazy. Um, but it's hard, uh, you know, when you are talking about progressive principles and progressive programs, there's a lot of nuance involved. And as FDR said at one point, uh, when he was talking about, if I remember correctly, um, the Works Progress Administration, which, um, you know, Harry Hopkins was in charge of the WPA, and he was happy to, to basically put people to work on anything. And, you know, the term boondoggle originated uh, at the WPA because boondoggle was something that, you know, certain craftsmen in the Ozarks did, you know, these were actual objects, and it got applied to the whole. And Hopkins and FDR said, look, you know, if you want to uh, basically attack a program that helps people, all you have to do is find one thing to criticize, and then you can basically claim that it applies to the whole program. But if you were trying to explain what's good about Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid, or uh, the Affordable Care Act, you know, it's, you know, it's a long conversation. You can't do it in a sapphire. So, it, you know, there's sort of this, this embedded problem of messaging. And sometimes, uh, you know, good uh, politicians will be able to uh, defeat it in some point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. All right. Any, any last question? Uh, 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 oh. Okay, one more question and then we're gonna let him say um, one thank you very much for this one How are these things. When is the deficit? Um, you know, the federal deficit always comes up at this time and it's a big thing. Let, since I can remember being really a young child, the deficit has never gone away. It's always gotten bigger. And our kids and everything else have still inherited all the stuff that they inherited. And there's a bunch of who says that they're at one time to just say, okay, it's all right, and we just move on. So is it real? Is it, are we making a big deal out of this stuff? Or well, I mean, it's, it's not like we're dealing with a finite resource. It, it's real. A couple of things about it. First of all, Bill Clinton actually had a budget that was a surplus. Um, and, but I believe he's the only one in probably since the 30s, maybe the 20s, who, who had a surplus. I, you know, the deficit in the United States, we have the luxury of being able to finance our own deficit because we have the dollar. And we have a Fed, thanks to FDR actually, that has the pa a monetary power to to deal with it. I mean, the deficit just flows on that, you know, every so often someone will, you know, trot out some statistic. The, the federal deficit is now, you know, more than 100% of gross domestic product. And, you know, intelligent <laughs> economists say, well, th that's totally meaningless because, you know, we've gross domestic product is a measurement of a snapshot in time this year, and the deficit gets paid out or covered over up to 30 years, because we have up to 30 year bonds. Um, Republicans will complain about the deficit when the Democrats are in office, 
And Democrats don't really complain about it, even when Republicans are in office. You know, Maynard Keynes, you know, said, look, you know, the, the government's job at times of economic stress is to basically run a deficit because private enterprise withdraws from the economy. Somebody has to step in and it's the government. And that's why we get deficits. In the 40s, we had the highest ratio of federal debt to GDP ever, or at least, you know, since 1900 um, because of World War II. And it got paid down pretty smartly over the next 10 or 15 years to a, you know, to a dull roar. And then it rose again, um, you know, when we had a recession, it rose again when we needed to spend money to keep people hale and hearty during the pandemic. Uh, that's what government is for. Um, you know, when people say, well, you know, would, would your family sitting over the dinner table, you know, spend more than you were? No, but the government is not a family, you know, it's a different thing and it's there so that families can actually make ends meet. So that also, let's say that. Now that concludes our program. <laughs> <laughs> our journey. All right.